morning, good morning, good morning, and good morning. It's Michael E. Gerber and Rabbi Levi Kunin. I'm the wandering Jew. Rabbi Kunin, in case you haven't figured it out yet, is the practicing Jew. And I know he's figured it out, so I'll let him talk about it. Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning, Reb Mikhail. How are you today? I'm doing fine. And why Good do you call you. me Reb Mikhail? You know, it, in America, you say like Mr. Gerber. Yes. Right. So it's a there's a, a certain level of respect when someone calls you Mr. Berger, Mr. Gerber. <laughs> now, not everybody likes to be called that way, but there's also more endearing ways in how we can refer to each other. In the shtetl, that's the way they would re refer to each other. For many years, not just in the shtetl, our great grandparents, that's the way that they would address each other. Reb Bechol, Reb Levi. So, uh, so that was like the, uh, the intro. And, uh, and so therefore, um, it's, it's kind of like almost like habitual. I got it. So it comes from the shtetl. Well, not, I mean, it comes, it's Eastern Europe. I mean, that's the way that, that's yeah. the way that the Jews addressed each other in Eastern Europe. I got it. Was a Reb before your name. I got it. Now, yeah. obviously, if you are, if you are a shtick, I don't want to say what, then you lost the title Reb. Okay. <laughs> and that's kind of how they made the distinction. I got it. You know what I'm saying? So would you please, uh, for our audience, whomever they may be, we have yet to involve our audience in this conversation meaning we're not talking with the audience and the audience is not speaking with us. And that's because we really haven't gone out to attract an audience yet. We're just having a conversation between the two of us, getting grounded, figuring out what we're doing here and so forth. But for that audience, and I'm presuming if this is, going to work at all, our audience will comprise probably more wandering Jews than it will practicing Jews. Because I would imagine practicing Jews among us uh, will grow weary of my conversation long before this. Um, they've already heard, heard anything I have to say and have lost interest in hearing any more of what I have to say. But wandering Jews might, uh, but it's a tough nut to crack. So I'm saying that, please then for the wandering Jews among us who are less informed than the other wandering Jews among us, what do you mean when you say shtetl? Da da dee da da da. Da, da, dee, da, dee, da. So the actual that would that that when I first saw Fiddler on the Roof, uh, I personally believe it or not, although I was entertained by it, I was offended by it because of the uh, the, the 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 way in which the shtetl was uh, presented. The shtetl literally means a city, and throughout most of the last two thousand years, Jews were not allowed to live in cosmopolitan areas. They were not allowed to live in capitals. Most of Jewish history is such. And as such, the Jewish people would form communities where they were very, very tightly knitted together. And if a woman had a baby, when, when a woman had a baby, immediately there was a support team there, meals being delivered, um, people taking care of the kids. It was like, you know, like you can't, it's like it was, it was, a, it was a, an epic, epic, tight, communities all over Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, they had their own share of problems, many of them, politics, you know, all different types of stuff. There was a structure to the shtetl. There was like the, the uh, president of the community. There was a rabbi of the community. And uh, there was a, uh, they, they, they produced their own kosher meat, had their own kosher butchers. And uh, many of them went around to, would travel to make business and come back. They leave for several months. Uh, it was, for the most part, they were not wealthy people, for the most part. Of course, there were periods of time where there were very, very wealthy Jews. But in, in terms of the shtetl part, uh, it, was, uh, it was usually, you know, uh, that, and I, I don't know if I'm describing the scene, but it was very, very warm, filled with love. 
and caring. And, uh, you know, people would do a lot of things together. They'd go to synagogue several times a day together. They'd learn. The women would get together and, uh, and, 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 and be with their kids. So it was, a, it was a whole, it was a whole scene. I, I don't know that I've ever seen like a uh, series of any sort that would honestly describe what the shtetl was like, you know? You know, it has ever honestly described what it was like? What, yeah, I, yeah when, like I said, when you look at Fiddler on the Roof and they attempt to show what life was in the shtetl, it's a very, very sad uh, representation in comparison to what the stories that I've read about so many of them uh, that took place in these shtetls, you know? So in, in reality, when you say it's a miracle we're here. Oh, it, it's for real. <laughs> it's, it's, as, it's as much of a miracle as you can possibly. I mean, if we, just, if we only knew our history, it, it's, it, it's, it's something that's, you know, nobody has to convince us, you know? Yeah. And that history has written, been written about. Of course, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, but it's not been read by many. Correct. I mean, look, you know, if you want, if you want a metaphor for that, the fact that uh, most of the countries of this world still deny the fact that Jerusalem has any Jewish heritage to it is obscene. It's sick. The, the evidence is so powerful and clear in so many different directions it's sick but they don't bother to discover that you know so when we think of that as a metaphor i think that's true about many things that are true in our life but we don't we're not for whatever reason you know we don't uh that's not, that's not necessarily our route that we take naturally you know so you know people, people here we are just uh 75 years after the Holocaust and the, dis and, the, and the disconnect between the younger generation, many of the younger generation, and the events of 75 years ago is staggering, you know. But uh, such is the way of man. It's the design in which we occur. And uh, the good news is we have been given some special, special, special forces within us, which some of which I'm going to share with you about one idea today. But we've been given special forces where we have the ability that at the moment that we have that awareness to pursue it and to, again, like we spoke yesterday, to get a deeper knowing in what's going on, you know? And knowing our history gets us connected to that miracle very powerfully, you know? And what would you recommend to be the best of all the books that have been written on our history? Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a Rabbi Beryl Wine. B E R E L, and then one is W E I N, I believe, yes, W E I N, barrelwine.com. So uh, he has a whole series of great history lessons that one could listen to. He also has books that he's written on it. There's a, on Chabad.org, there's something called Our People. You could look it up, you could read it online, Our People. And it, it's five books, uh, they're all available uh, at no cost. and meaning to read it online and uh, you could read through, you know, the story of our people, at least in a, at, a, in, at a glance and see you know, the miracles to which uh, are, are responsible for us being here today. Wonderful. Thank you, Levi. So what shall we talk about this morning? Uh, so I want to share with you uh, a, something that's connected to today. You know, I'm, I'm so happy you got to read a little bit of the Torah yesterday. And, but I want to share with you something that's connected to today. From the time that we left Egypt, which is Passover time, to the time that we received the Torah at Sinai, which is the next holiday coming up, there are 49 days. And actually, <clears throat> the Torah instructs us to count these 49 days. Today is the 25th. And to count these days, not just counting them, but to use it as an exercise to purify our vessel so that we could be prepared to receive the Torah. What does that mean to purify our vessel? Why is it necessary? So 
this goes into something that's in Kabbalistic. I'm not going to go into the entirety of it. I want to give one point that's connected to today. But in Kabbalah, our persona occurs through specific, a specific template, which is called the 10 sephiros, the 10 characteristics, the 10 shining points, three of which are intelligent, intelligence, and six of which are, emo are, are emotions, and the last of which is the way we are occurring. We have the right of us, which is love, the left of us, which is awe and fear, the center, which is balance. We also have behavioral. So we have in the emotions itself, we have these are all part of who we are as human beings. This is just who we are. So every, every part of who we are could be a vessel for something great, or the opposite. Who we are is simply the template in which we occur. So we have the ability to love, but not always is our act of love a good thing. Sometimes our act of love is not a good thing. So we have that ability to love that's part of one of our characteristics, but it could go either way. The same is also true about the left side of us, which is where anger comes from or also fear and also awe. In its highest form, it could be serving as the, the space in which we get into a state of awe when we think about our maker. In its lowest space, it's where anger is being driven from. That's the characteristic. Not good or bad, it just is. So every day, we're meant to look into the specifics, and we could go on to Chabad.org and read about the Sefirat HaOmer. Very interesting, the exercises of every day. I'll send you a link to that. And... Today's exercise is fascinating. It's fascinating. Because one of the characteristics that we have is called Netzach. Netzach means victorious. Spell it. N-E-T-Z-A-C-H. And this component of us is the ability to continue fighting even if the drive is not there anymore. It's called, that's where commitment comes from. It's the ability, to, I remember there was a, a, a situation here in Malibu where one guy sold his house and him and his, uh, the guy who bought the house wanted to take the, uh, he, he, the owner, the original owner wanted to take his tree in the front yard, which was in a pot. He wanted to take it. And the guy who bought the house, which was for millions of dollars, didn't want to. He said, that, that's part of it. He says, no, I, I, clearly I told you, whatever. So this $700 pot ended up being a lawsuit that was over $100,000 was spent on. Does that make any sense? No, it makes no sense. But once that victory thing, winning, netzach, victory, enduring, gets activated at its fullest, it almost becomes brain dead. It almost becomes divorced of that which originally drove it. It could, but it could also do something amazing in a powerful way. Because when we make a commitment to do something, to create a new habit, the, that is letting us know that we have that possibility to habituate ourselves to such a degree that even in a moment of doubt, I'll still get up and daven. Even, in a, if, I, even, if, I, even if, I, if I wake up and, and not feeling inspired, I have that ability to enact that behavioral characteristic within me, despite the fact that that which originally drove it is not present in a revealed way right now. That's why when we get married, we get married, we make a covenant. You don't need a covenant if you love each other and you're always loving each other. But you, we need the covenant because sometimes we're not feeling that way. But we're committing to the behavior of love, despite that which may not be present at that moment. So today is when we, we, we contemplate victory of victory. That's like the ultimate, ultimate person, I mean, the ultimate entrepreneur that doesn't ever give up. I remember hearing from that guy, Jack Ma from Alibaba, <laughs> about the many, many jobs that, that, he, that they, they told him, you're, you're worthless, you know? It's a possibility within us to do it, to commit to doing it, and to remain committed to doing it in a way where no longer nothing could shake it anymore. And this is connected to the endurance of the Jewish people, which is another conversation. But it's a powerful thing. We ask ourselves today, where am I using that aspect in my life right now? And how could I use that for a way 
that will shine light in the world. For example, if a person makes up a commitment, every day I'm going to, to do a certain mitzvah. I'm going to give X amount of charity every day to somebody. And one day they're not feeling inspired. This lets us know that we have that within us. It's possible that we could activate it. And by doing so, we're able to serve our purpose in the highest of ways because when we connect to that force, it transcends our intelligence, which is why it's able to go against our intelligence at times. So I hope I made sense to you. But that's it today's uh, teaching and exercise. It makes great sense to me. My wife um, speaks about that all the time. What she said, despite what happens to you, despite the, the terrible things that occur, Despite how many ways you've been told no, 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 you persist, you persist, you persist, you persist. Where does that come from? And you're speaking about it. Correct. It's, an, it's a characteristic in your soul. And all it takes is for us to activate it. Yeah. And so she reminds me of that and activates that. Because she is committed to realizing what is called my dream. And um, whenever, despite how difficult it appears, despite how impossible it appears, despite how worthless it appears, um, we each persist, each in our own way, toward the evolution of that even when we're not feeling it, even when it's simply the stupidest thing we could possibly be doing, um, it's still there and it still drives me and her. And it's a wonder it does because everything in the world is telling me it doesn't work. Everybody on the planet is telling me you're wasting your time. Um, and so forth and so forth and so forth. And it was interesting because um, early, early, early this morning, I received an email and I received these emails from this woman who's an orthodontist um, and she sends out emails every day. And um, this particular email was um, start. The, the word is start. Um, despite the fact that you don't believe, despite the fact that it doesn't make sense, despite the fact, start. And um, she goes on to describe two people who started um, 10,000 times before he actually discovered the light bulb. Um, the the um, Kentucky Fried Chicken um, Colonel Sanders, at 65, he got 1,099 no's when he went out to try to sell his uh, recipe for, and finally on the 1,100, he got a yes. And now we have Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so my point is, at 65, with his wife, and the restaurant was shut down because a freeway was driven through the property and nobody could get to the restaurant. Here's this man persisting, 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 pers and it's nets up what you're describing. Correct, correct. Yeah. And, and, and when it's activated in its highest form, like when it's done in a selfless way, when it's being used in a selfless way, then that's the closest that we get to our maker. <clears throat> Because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it really has, it, re it really goes into a space of no limitations. And um, it's, it's, you know, obviously our maker is beyond any conversation. But in the teachings of Hasidus, the, the presence of that force is most in that moment, in that space. Because it's kind of not really, a, there's some level of it that's not even about self anymore. It's, it's actually going against self at times. You know, um, and uh, and it's a it's a very it's a it's a powerful powerful way. But it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful exercise to be able to have this possibility every day to think about and to learn about, you know, um, different parts of who we are, and identifying those parts of who we are. Yeah. 
and then uh, being able to do something about it and think about it and contemplate where we're, where we're at. It's very, very amazing. The difference between the two, Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is obviously um, not what you're talking about. What you're talking about is um, the calling from Hashem. Um, but I imagine Colonel Sanders um, didn't know the difference. My guess would be the same. And the point is, that it's, and it's a beautiful conversation in the teachings of Hasidism, is that both, both sides get to activate that, unfortunately. It's the way it is for now. Yes. So, so, so you're able to see the same, the same power and force, which again is, is a, not, you know, it's hard to, for the mind to wrap itself around this, but there is no space that's void of our maker. I'm going to ask exactly. you to remember this tomorrow, uh, the right side and the left side. Yes. Let's have that conversation tomorrow. All right. Perfect. Wonderful. So Rabbi Kunin, thank you very much for today's brief conversation. Um, they always lead somewhere and you always have a story that takes us there. Um, and our guests uh, benefit from that fact. And I'll take credit for the fact that I always find interest in where you take us. So there's something to be said about that as well. Uh, love you. Ladies and gentlemen, a delight being here with you today. We'll see you here tomorrow, God willing. Baruch Hashem. Bye-bye. Baruch Hashem. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.